Hello and welcome to another lecture in the Abralinha ao Vivo series. Abralinha ao Vivo is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. The purpose of the series is to give students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussion on the most diverse topic, topics related to the study of human language. Today, I'd like to introduce Gregory Hickok. Hickok has been on the faculty at the University of California Irvine since 96, where he is currently professor of cognitive sciences and language science. He was the founding chair of the Society for the Neuro Neurobiology of Language, served as editor-in-chief of Psychonomic Bulletin and Review from 2014 until 2019, and is author of The Myth of Mirror Neurons, published in 2014. The title of his lecture today is Recent Progress Mapping, the Neurobiology of Language. Questions and comments are very welcome in the chat. Please join me and welcome Gregory Hickok. Thank you very much. I am uh, honored to be invited to give a, a lecture in, in this forum. Um, so why don't I share my screen and we will get going. Okay, I assume you can see everything okay. Um, so uh, yeah, like, um, uh, like we said, the topic of my talk is recent progress in mapping the neurobiology of language. I'm going to be focusing on the architecture of neural systems, and I want to spend a couple uh, seconds uh, defending this approach a bit. So there's a lot of work on um, dynamics, uh, including um, neural work on oscillation patterns and things like that. And this is all a good thing. Dynamics are real. It's important to understand them. Um, but dynamics operate in the context of neural architectures, that is, um, uh, components of the system and their arrangement with, uh, with other subsystems. Um, and these determine the input-output relations that the dynamics end up computing. Um, and uh, this is often these kind of neural architectures, at least in my hands, uh, is often expressed as box and arrow models, which these days is, is sometimes um, uh, considered old fashioned. So I wanna point out that um, even the cool kids from the AI research groups, for example, at Google uh, have recognized uh, the importance of architecture. So here's a quote from a relatively recent paper um, uh, talking about neural network success. Uh, along with the success of um, uh, artificial intelligence, it is a, uh, is a paradigm shift from feature designing to architecture designing. And that's because the architecture of these networks is really what makes them, them work. Many of the dynamics are, are quite similar in terms of the way that subnetworks interact. It's the architectures that often determine whether a network is gonna fail or not. So it's worth spending some time, not only on the neural dynamics, but also in, on the architectures that these dynamics operate within. So let me give a preview of my a talk today. Uh, I'm going to start with the old stuff, uh, which is an overview of the dual stream model of speech processing that David Popple and I um, uh, developed, uh, and with a little sprinkling of new data, which uh, confirms the old stuff, essentially. Um, and then I'm going to contextualize this uh, older model um, and talk about how ideas uh, about dual stream models have evolved over time uh, and through history. Um, and then I'm going to give a, a kind of newer perspective on the old stuff. We think of the, always talk about these models in terms of dual stream, but in fact, um, dual stream models are only dual stream from a particular perspective. Um, there are other perspectives where they're not dual stream at all, at all and I'll show you that. And then I'm going to look at all of this stuff um, and glean some architectural generalizations from this old stuff and combine that with a little bit of evolutionary biology to uh, make some generalizations that we can use in hypothesizing the architecture of language systems. And then I'll finally get to the new stuff, which of course is built out from the old stuff, uh, which is uh, recent ideas um, that I've been working on uh, on the neurobiology of syntax. So that is the plan. Let's jump in. Um, so here's the old stuff. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, the Hickok-Puppel dual stream model 
the motivating question that we were trying to address when we started developing this in the late uh, 1990s actually, was what is the neural organization of speech perception? And it was quite unclear at the time. There were multiple competing claims and some puzzling data, it turns out. So um, one observation was that unilateral damage to the left hemisphere, anywhere in the left hemisphere, typically did not cause severe uh, speech perception deficits, that is receptive deficits at the phonological level, when these abilities were tapped with word picture matching comprehension tasks. So that's one uh, piece of data. Um, however, uh, you do see uh, deficits on speech perception, uh, certain speech perception tasks more reliably following unilateral left hemisphere damage. And in particular, you see deficits on tasks like syllable discrimination, where uh, a person is given a pair of syllables like ba and pa and asked to judge whether they're the same or different. Um, and these two tasks um, doubly dissociate. So you, in the same patient, you can have someone who was good at one and bad at the other and vice versa. Um, and this is a bit of a puzzle um, because how is it that someone who can't discriminate ba from pa can nonetheless perfectly discriminate um, or identify uh, a word like bear and discriminate it and point to a picture of a bear um, when a competitor is paired? So same sounds, you still have to hear the difference, um, but you can do it during comprehension and not so much during a discrimination task. Um, so here's some data. So all of the data that we used to develop the original dual stream model um, was gleaned from older literature. Um, I, uh, that literature still exists, of course, but I'm gonna reinforce um, what we had used previously with some new data that makes the point. So we've been working on um, modernizing the, the data source for a lot of these original claims. And this is something that um, a former student, Corianne Rogalski, started doing as a grad student with me um, quite a while ago now. Uh, and it's just now coming to fruition. So we have a, a this is a stroke study. Where we're studying speech perception with a variety of tasks. <clears throat> um, we have 109 cases. Um, and this is what the distribution of performance looks like on the, the auditory comprehension task. So this is a task where people are hearing words like bear, simple nouns um, like bear. They have an array of pictures, maybe uh, the target bear, a phonological foil like pear, um, a semantic foil, maybe a moose, and then an unrelated foil like uh, grapes. And they're just asked simply to point to the picture. This is the distribution of um, uh, proportion correct number of patients at each uh, bin of proportion correct on this task. Um, this is the percentage of cases or the number of cases here. Um, and you can see that uh, most of the distribution is piled up at, at the ceiling level. So only 4.6% of the distribution is doing worse than 90% correct. So it's very hard to find um, deficits on this task uh, is the main point here. Um, however, if you look at syllable discrimination, in this case, word discrimination, or yeah, non-word discrimination. This is D prime units. Think of these as standard deviations. Um, and uh, this is a performance on the clear auditory comprehension test. And what I want you to focus on, so that's the pair bear task, it are these group of patients who perform perfectly on the, the word comprehension test. And yet um, we see a wide distribution of performance on the discrimination test. Um, so broad distribution of syllable discrimination scores among these cases. So you can see that they dissociate. Um, now we can plot these directly just to reinforce this point. If I can get the slide to advance, there we go. So um, here I've kind of, uh, to make the comparison a little tighter, I've changed the task slightly. So we also used a uh, word in noise task, um, same comprehension test pair bear kind of thing, except that the speech was presented in noise. So we got people off the ceiling and you can see now that instead of piled up at the ceiling, we've got uh, people's performance spread out more um, ranging between like 30% to just under hundred percent. Plotting that against word discrimination. Again, this is D prime. So essentially these are the same words that people are either being asked to comprehend or to discriminate in pairs. Um, and you can see that knowing one a value on one of the axes is not a very good predictor of uh, how they'll perform on the other task. And we can quantify this um, by uh, binning people into either impaired or spared uh, bins based on um, a control group. 
And here is the basic double dissociation where you have people who are um, impaired on one task and spared on the other and vice versa. And what's interesting to me are these cases where uh, people are um, impaired on word discrimination. So you say bear, pair, same, different, and they fail that task. And then you ask them to present the word bear, ask them to point to the picture of the bear and, and not the picture of the pair, and they're fine on that. So this is, uh, this is a bit of a puzzle. Um, <clears throat> the neural correlates of these abilities also uh, partially dissociate. So this is taking the same data, continuation of the same study, and mapping the lesion correlates. Where are the lesions that are associated with these deficits? Um, and here is the lesion distribution for the comprehension and noise task. And we're using the one at noise because there's just not enough variance on the clear speech task to do a lesion mapping um, analysis. And you can see that it is uh, temporal lobe damage. Uh, the discrimination tasks are shown here. So word discrimination is in um, this purple color. Uh, word discrimination and non-word discrimination is um, this uh, the, the broader uh, picture. And what you notice is that you start getting more dorsal involvement on the discrimination task, as well as involvement in this posterior region here, which is a, a zone that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and we can compare these um, what you see here is regions that are unique to the discrimination tasks. So that's this yellow zone, more dorsal and unique to the uh, comprehension task. Um, and so you basically get this dorsal ventral split um, on these two tasks. Uh, so this brings, this is the data, the kind of data that motive without the, the detailed lesion data that motivated the original dual stream model that David Popple and I developed. Um, so the basic idea here is that um, the brain has to compute two distinct kinds of transformations um, over uh, auditory perceptual information. So perceptual information that's coming in in this uh, box diagram, you do some spectrotemporal analysis in auditory cortex, that's these green zones, uh, and then you access some phonological information of some sort, that's these yellow zones here. And then um, you can either take that information and map it onto meaning through a lexical interface to a conceptual network or map it onto a motor articulatory network through this sensory motor interface, this area we call SPT. Um, it's it's a, a region that we didn't initially hypothesize, but um, some grad students and I in my lab uh, discovered this area and named it SPT. So those are the two kinds of mappings that you need to do with speech information. Um, and there are distinct ventral and dorsal pathways for each. So the shared part is up to the phonological level, this STS, resubior temporal sulcus region bilaterally, and then it splits off into a ventral stream and a dorsal stream. Um, and which network you engage is going to depend on the task. So we saw in the previous uh, version, if you're doing comprehension, you're engaging this ventral network. If you're doing um, discrimination, you're engaging this network. And we're going to tie that more closely to production in a sec. Um, there's also an asymmetric uh, lateralization pattern. So the ventral stream, which you can see here in the brain map uh, cartoon here, the ventral stream is more bilateral. It's not entirely equal in the two hemispheres, but to a first approximation, um, whereas the dorsal stream is left dominant. So that's the basics of the dual stream model. And the way this explained the puzzles um, that I highlighted uh, a minute ago, um, is, is this. So the uni unilateral damage doesn't cause severe speech perception deficits on comprehension tasks. And that's because the ventral stream is bilateral. So if you damage anything here, um, you're, you're only interrupting at most half of the network and you have the other half that can compensate well enough to perform quite well. Uh, syllable discrimination deficits are caused by unilateral damage. And the, the reasoning here is that um, this requires some sort of conscious phonological short-term memory, which depends on the dorsal stream. So you have to use, uh, so think about what you're doing when you're doing a discrimination task. You're coding that first bit of information uh, and then you're holding it in a short-term store while you're waiting for the next bit of information. And then you're comparing the two and then you're making a decision. And the claim is that this involves a part of the articulatory network, at least this part here. Um, and the two tasks dissociate, again, because the, lead, the distribution of um, uh, regions involved are separate and the two tasks differentially weight the dorsal and ventral streams. So I want to give you one intuitive sense of how changing the task to a discrimination rather than a comprehension task, where we're asking people to consciously decide whether two sounds, speech sounds are the same or not, 
really does change the process. So here's my um, kind of uh, on the fly example. I want you to pay very close attention to the next sentence I utter. When we ask listeners to make conscious judgments about, judgments about sublexical features of speech sounds, such as in a syllable discrimination task, they are using mechanisms that are not normally used in everyday receptive speech processing. So I'll let you think about that for a second. Um, you, I can tell you probably what you went through. You didn't know the answer to that immediately. And that's because when we're perceiving speech, we are not listening to phonemes or syllables. We're listening to the content. We're hearing the content. The rest of that is just information that's being used to get to the content. And it's not consciously attended to. Uh, uh, those of you who were trying to figure out the answer, you probably were sub vocally trying to rehearse what I had said in your head. And now you're using your articulatory mechanisms to try to solve the problem, um, kind of illustrating the point. Now, if I had, if I read it again and asked you to consciously listen to, for a ba, you could do that, but um, it would, you would be bringing some additional resources to the table. And I would argue that those additional neurocomputational resources are those other networks that aren't tapped by normal comprehension. Um, Okay, so we're moving on to the next section, which is the context for uh, all of these models. Um, so we didn't um, just invent this stuff um, ourselves. Um, they're not, in, nor are the ideas of dual stream uh, models unique to language, uh, but rather uh, seem to be general principles of how cortex is organized for perception and um, possibly with deep evolutionary roots. Um, so the starting point when people talk about dual streams is usually the two vis visual systems model of uh, Ungerleiter and Mish Mishkin from the 80s, which um, stemmed from observations that damage to ventral temporal areas in macaque monkeys led to um, uh, difficulty in performing a what-based task, like telling the difference between two different shapes of objects, whereas more dorsal damage in the inferior parietal lobe um, cause problems with uh, using the location of objects uh, to perform a discrimination task, identifying the food well that was near to the um, shape, no matter what shape it was. Um, and this led to the two visual systems model, the what where system. The idea is that the ventral stream is involved in processing what um, a visual stimulus is, whereas in the, the dorsal stream is involved in processing where that uh, signal is coming from. Uh, this uh, led to uh, a similar view in uh, the auditory system. Uh, Joseph Rochecker proposed in Macaque Monkeys a similar what where distinction in audition. Um, and, uh, but interposed between those, the visual system model had been revised by Milner and Goodale. Um, the ventral stream was still considered a what stream, uh, but the dorsal stream was um, reconceptualized not just as a location based system, but as a system designed to take visual features of objects or, uh, or things and map them onto motor systems. So how, if you're going to interact with an object like um, a cup, how are you going to take the visual features and map that onto an action so that you could grasp the cup, for example? And this is referred to as the how versus what, the how, how being different, what is the same. So again, dorsal ventral, different reconceptualization or different, slightly different framework. And this, uh, how versus what model was what directly influenced us in developing um, a dual stream model for speech, uh, where we took their idea, how versus what, and applied it to speech. And that's how we ended up with this model. Uh, a little bit later, Ross Shecker teamed up with Sophie Scott, uh, where uh, both of the dorsal stream um, question words were preserved. So you have a where and a how, where how is a predictive feedback mechanism uh, versus the what, which everyone seems to generally agree that the ventral stream is uh, a what stream. Um, but it's important to recognize that dual stream models um, of vision predate Ungerleiter and Mishkin. Um, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, you see multiple claims about two visual systems in multiple species, primates, frogs, so on. Um, you can go back even farther to the 18. Uh, 80s, um, where Hugo Munster Munsterberg um, observed that when we apperceive the stimulus, we have, as a rule, already started responding to it. Our motor apparatus does not wait for our conscious awareness, but does restlessly its duty, and our consciousness watches it and has no right to give it orders. So distinguishing between kind of reflexive sensory motor responses to objects on one hand uh, with um, the conscious recognition of those things on the other. <clears throat> 
Uh, likewise, in the auditory domain, Diana Deutsch was talking about um, separate what and where systems in audition uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, and even farther back, uh, Stephen Poljak in the 20s was talking about um, a double function of the auditory system. Um, I won't go through the quote there. Uh, but um, going back even farther, and perhaps the original dual stream model was uh, due to Carl Wernicke, who was famous for uh, developing the first neurocognitive model of language here shown on his, what looks like a nerdy um, uh, trading card for academics. Um, and he, drew a model of, of uh, how he thought language worked in the brain. And this is his drawing here, drawn in the right hemisphere for reasons we don't understand. He talked about it as being a left dominant system, um, that it was composed of two systems. Um, and what he described was a model that looked something like this. So I'll um, uh, kind of talk about this one. So he talked about uh, an auditory, a center for auditory word images. That was your sensory based representation, auditory based representation of words a motor-based representation of words, and these connected to a widely distributed uh, conceptual network um, corresponding to the meaning of the words. Um, so you had essentially a, a mapping. If you're listening to speech, you had to map the auditory, you recognize the auditory form of the word, and then map that onto the meaning. And that was a what stream. Didn't talk about it this way, but um, it is patently a dual stream model. Uh, and on the other hand, if you were just going to repeat that auditory uh, word, you could uh, map it directly onto the motor system. That is how you would go from an auditory to a motor representation for speaking. Um, so it is a dual stream model. Interestingly, uh, Wernicke talked about this, how this, uh, how stream worked. Uh, and here is his quote talking about fluent patients, people with um, fluent aphasia, uh, and noting that aside from a deficient comprehension, which is typical in uh, like uh, the, his namesake aphasia type, Wernicke's aphasia, um, the fluent patient has aphasic manifestations in speaking as well because of the absence of the corrective function exercised unconsciously by the sound images. So he, even though there were direct connections between concept and motor, he believed that, the, that you reactivated the auditory system and this had a corrective mechanism. And this is essentially, uh, sensory feedback control, which is a prominent notion in um, motor control work and something that I've made use of um, that he kind of um, previewed back in the 1870s. Um, our dual stream model is essentially a modification of Wernicke's original. So all we did essentially is add a lexical interface between the auditory and the conceptual node and an auditory motor interface between the auditory and the motor network. Um, and again, SPT is what we believe is the auditory motor interface. If you're interested in this, because I'm not going to talk about it much, here's where it lives, um, right at the back of the Sylvian fissure. Um, and here's a couple of papers that you can look at for some of the empirical basis for um, this area. So um, the question I want to focus on, though, is why, uh, what, and how are perpetually rediscovered in multiple modalities um, uh, and so on. Um, one possibility is that it's just true and people just rediscover it because it, it's the truth about how things work. And in fact, um, it almost has to be true because there are distinct going mapping from a percep perceptual input onto a motor plan versus a uh, kind of conceptual categorization requires distinct computational demands. And this is going to end up involving different neural networks. So consider this example. Um, here are these two objects. Um, if you're going to understand the meaning of them, you're going to, to extract certain features about them um, that uh, give rise to very different semantics of these two objects. However, if you're gonna interact with them uh, motorically, then you could use a, pretty much the same uh, actions. Um, and so they're distinct, uh, basically computing semantics from a sensory input versus a motor action are uh, quite dissociable. Um, predictably, often what happens at this point when uh, one distinguishes between a couple of networks is, is people talk um, about um, how these systems interact. And they do, obviously. So, you know, as illustrated by this picture, obviously uh, we can reach for these two objects in the picture in exactly the same way, but we want to know what they are in order to decide whether to reach for them in the first place. And maybe knowing what they are will inform how we reach for it in certain respects. So people will say the streams interact, that dichotomizing two streams obscures the dynamics. 
that um, pointing to observations that production involves sensory uh, systems and perception involves motor systems. Um, and it's just one big dynamic network. Um, so this is predictable. Um, and in fact, if you look at lots of different areas, um, uh, and this is just a bit of an aside, lots of different neurocognitive areas, there seems to be a kind of five stages of, of progress in neurocognitive systems. You start out thinking it's one system. Oh no, it's actually two systems. And then some people develop uh, the idea that the two systems are actually one system. And then they realize that, okay, they are two, but they interact massively. And then the fifth stage is we just don't know how it works. Um, hopefully we're not at the fifth stage with respect to language research, but this is typically how things go. And so we're kind of in the dual stream language stuff. We're somewhere in here, I think. Um, but I think part of this confusion can be uh, diffused um, because uh, if we recognize that is, there's a confusion about the perspective that these models are couched in. So dual stream models are all perceptual models. So uh, these are vision perception folks. These are auditory folks. Uh, and when David Popel and I were interested in, in uh, and developed our dual stream model, we were primarily in, were interested in speech perception. Um, so the, and the main point there is that there are two different systems that perceptual representations need to interface with. They need to interface with conceptual representations and motor representations, and they are distinct. And that doesn't change, um, and that, that is constant. Um, so here's just to illustrate um, how a different perspective will give you a different view of these streams. Um, here's the standard view, and this was our interest when we developed it, we wanted to know how information might go uh, as it entered auditory cortex, you access phonological information, and then you could either through lexical access, access uh, get to conceptual memory, or you could map it through a sensory motor transformation and uh, get to motor plans for reproducing what you heard, for example. But if we think about the same network, just reconfigured from the perspective of production, say we just wanna name a picture, um, so there, if we're looking at a picture, we access conceptual memory, then we access um, lexical information that corresponds to the name of the thing, and then we access a phonological code, and then ultimately we get it to motor planning. Um, and now here, there is no dual stream. It's just one stream, and you have auditory cortex kind of sitting off as an appendage to the side. So from a different perspective, um, it is uh, not dual stream at all. And so that, I think, leads to some, some confusion. Um, also, interestingly, uh, the organization of this system, if we're thinking about production, maps very neatly onto uh, standard psycholinguistic models of production. So you have a conceptual layer, a semantic layer here in the Dell model, for example, of word production. You have a word layer that's here, and then a phonological layer that's here. Um, and so it, it fits quite well with um, existing um, models of production. Uh, there's another point that I want to make about this, and that is, again, engagement of subportions of this network are task dependent. And we, so we've discussed this in relation to differences between comprehension tasks and discrimination tasks. I want to generalize that a bit and point out that there is an asymmetry um, between comprehension and production. So different sub networks of the overall language network are differentially um, activated or involved in comprehension, language comprehension versus production. Um, again, Wernicke uh, had this down. So again, here's Wernicke's model. And just to illustrate um, that comprehension in his model involves a sub portion of the network. It doesn't involve this portion of the network. Repetition, that is just hearing something and reproducing it, involves um, this sub portion, uh, whereas production involves the entire network. Um, so you're going to get production deficits no matter where you have damage. Um, and again, here's some here's some data. I'm going to re-show this data just to convince you again that Wernicke has this correct. Um, so uh, comprehension uh, does involve this network here. Um, when you damage these areas, you don't have uh, comprehension problems, which is what this lesion map shows. Um, uh, if we look at repetition, uh, there we have a different network, um, a more dorsal network that involves this SPT area um, uh, implicated in non-word repetition. This is another stroke-based study um, where we're mapping le deficits on non-word repetition onto brain, the, the, the lesions that cause them. Um, and 
we can study production. Um, and this is kind of a fancy way to study production uh, developed by my um, collaborator, Grant Walker. This is a, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but this is a multinomial processing tree model that of naming. So this is just simple picture naming. Um, but of course, naming uh, pictures, producing words involves multiple stages. Um, and um, using this method, we can decompose the substages. And so that's the, the point that I want to make. So we can estimate sub abilities in the naming process from lexical stages to sublexical phonological stages, and so on. Details are provided in, in some uh, several publications on this model. What I want to show you, though, is yet unpublished data um, of a study with uh, over 100 people with aphasia on a 175 item naming test. Um, and we modeled the error type distributions with MPT and then mapped the estimates of the subabilities onto the lesions. Um, and so we were able to identify a semantic network. Um, we were able to identify um, a lexical and lexical phonological networks. And you can see kind of the sylvian areas, um, kind of middle temporal gyrus, supertemporal sulcus regions here involved in that. Uh, and then sublexical phonological uh, abilities map onto more sensory motor regions. So the point here is that production, even of simple words, involves the entire language network from frontal areas to posterior areas and so on. So essentially confirming Wernicke's original claim um, that you get this asymmetry between comprehension and production. So I, again, I want to hammer this home. The general principle is that receptive language involves a subset of the language network. Expressive language involves the whole network. Okay. Um, and this makes some predictions that damage to motor related portions of the network can spare comprehension, um, whereas damage to sensory related portions of the network will affect both comprehension and production. So that's the production uh, receptive expressive asymmetry. And there are plenty of examples of this from um, neurolinguistics. For example, uh, people with apraxia of speech uh, have expressive problems um, with speech sequencing errors. They're dysprosodic, yet receptive abilities are spared. Um, and in um, Wernicke's aphasia, for example, um, you get poor comprehension, uh, it's especially at um, sentence level. Uh, and their output is um, also disrupted. They're fluent, um, but they're paraphasic and can be paragrammatic. And we'll see an example of that. So plenty of examples of this receptive expressive asymmetry. And this is useful. Um, this will be an important principle for us because it's quite consistent with motor control architectures um, and applies to syntax too. So at this point, I want to take all of this kind of background information, this older stuff, and combine it with a little bit of evolutionary biology and use that to generate some new hypotheses. And here's the logic. Um, we know, uh, and there's no disagreement, that speech and language evolved in a large-brained, bipedal, tool-making hominin um, line with sophisticated motor control and cognitive ability. So, um, the hominin line, the, the creatures out of which our linguistic abilities evolved were quite smart, um, highly developed, and surely had um, advanced cognitive abilities um, and motor control abilities as well. It was that context that language, uh, speech and language evolved. Um, so based on how evolution works, which is to tinker rather than uh, invent systems de novo, um, it is highly likely that speech and language systems are going to um, exhibit some computational and neuroarchitectural homologies to non-language systems. That means that they're gonna have perhaps similar architectures, even if they are distinct uh, in, terms of, um, in, in terms of their details, similar to uh, um, a bat wing and a, um, uh, our, our limbs, uh, which have, are homologous but serve different functions. Um, the dual stream organization of our brains uh, compared to primate brains is one example of this. We see this in multiple systems across um, multiple species. This may be a homologous relationship. And the idea that I've been exploring in the last several years is that language networks are going to have a homologous architecture um, to sensory motor control networks. And that doesn't mean that they are the same thing or reducible to it. It just means that they have a common neurocomputational architecture. Uh, or ancestor. Um, so let me just be really clear about that. So again, here's the idea. Um, 
what I've been trying to do is model uh, the phonological network broadly um, with a motor control architecture. So the typical approach is to assume that there's an abstract phonological network and maybe that maps onto this area here in this kind of uh, model. Um, and here's the conjecture that I've been working with, that um, the phonological network is actually not just one thing like this. It is a sensory motor, it has a sensory motor architecture with a frontal motor related component and a, a posterior sensory auditory related component. Um, and it has this kind of classic sensory motor like architecture. And this is the, the um, architecture that I came up with. Um, with a couple of colleagues, John Hood and uh, Feng Rong. Um, so here I've kind of, um, you can see a little hint of a um, psycholinguistic model here. Think of this as the phonological network. Um, this, uh, I've collapsed the lexical level and the semantic level here into one, because that wasn't what I was focusing on. Um, but here's the basic idea uh, where the auditory phone, so essentially, the phonological system has two components. It has a part of it tied to the auditory system, a part of it tied to the motor system. Um, and uh, these um, auditory areas uh, or representations during comprehension get activated and then mapped onto conceptual systems. During production, uh, you access a word you act, and then you access its phonological form on the auditory side, as well as on the motor side. This serves as the target in motor control um, uh, any kind of motor control architecture is all about hitting targets uh, with um, the motor plan. Um, so the idea is that this will serve as the target for a motor phonological plan. Um, and uh, the, the predictive architecture, which is also a motor control thing, is such that as you're planning this motor uh, sequence or whatever level you're planning at, you can generate a prediction. What is this motor plan uh, gonna end up being realized as on the uh, sensory side, um, and you can check it against the target. If it matches, great, you just go ahead and produce it. If it doesn't match, you can generate a correction. So this is so-called forward prediction and inverse um, mapping. Um, and this in general in the motor control world is called an internal model mediated by an auditory motor translation network. So this kind of sensory motor-like architecture is homologous to motor control architectures, but I'm applying it here, or the hypothesis is that it applies at the level of phonology. So all of what linguists are doing phonologically or psycholinguists are doing phonologically is underlyingly um, mediated by this kind of architecture. And we can localize the regions that these live and so on. So that's the basic idea. Um, we did a kind of proof of concept here. We took the, uh, the classic Dell model um, and split the phonological level into two. We had a kind of an auditory part and a, uh, an auditory part and a motor part. And we, and then connected them kind of like in a sensory motor architecture. And then we asked, does this architectural arrangement allow the network to work better? Um, it didn't have to be better, um, but it turned out that it was. It outperformed the original Dell model. And that doesn't prove anything, but it is nice to know that if you build a um, psycholinguistic model, uh, using a motor control inspired architecture, um, you can actually improve its performance. Um, I then went a bit further in decomposing this phonological network um, uh, in what I call a hierarchical state feedback control model. So state feedback control is basically just a, a motor control term, but we're again, we're applying it to levels of representation that uh, are linguistic. Um, you've seen this part before. This is just the auditory targets, the motor plans for hitting those targets. Here's SPT. I've now split the conceptual and lexical levels so you can see um, the standard kind of psycholinguistic levels, semantic word, and then this whole thing is phonological. The difference here is acknowledging research in motor control that um, somatosensory systems and lower level motor planning is implicated in speech production in speech planning. Um, and so we have not only auditory targets, we have somatosensory targets. So as you're generating vocal tract actions, we're trying to hit somatosensory targets like the feel of your lips coming together, a particular configuration of the vocal tract mediated by the cerebellum. And for details, you can see this uh, 2012 paper. Um, so the idea again here is that there are uh, that phonology is essentially um, distributed or decomposed into a, a hierarchically organized motor control like 
neurocomputational architecture, um, where higher levels are coding something closer to syllables, lower levels uh, in sensory motor cortex are coding something like articulatory feature clusters. Um, and for those of you who are interested in the white matter connectivity, this connection is likely in, uh, to our best guess, the outer arcuate. This is likely the inner arcuate, um, but those details don't matter. And just to remind you that this isn't that far removed from Wernicke, take Wernicke's model, flip it on its head. You've got the conceptual part. You've got auditory motor here. We've added some things in between uh, and added another bit of hierarchy. So it's... All right, so interim co conclusions. Dual stream organization um, is a claim about different kinds of network networks sen that sensory systems interact with. Okay, um, involvement of different portions of the network is task dependent. Um, evidence strongly supports an asymmetry of involvement in terms of comprehension involving a ventral stream and production, which involves the whole network, ventral and dorsal stream. Um, Integrating linguistic levels with motor control architectures is fruitful. Uh, we've made some progress and it makes good sense from an evolutionary biology perspective and Wernicke um, is basically still right, um, at least in sketch. Uh, so now we turn to syntax. Um, and I wanna give a brief history because again, I think that the history of things um, help, under help us understand um, where things were and where they're going as the meme uh, says. Um, so uh, way back in the 1800s, uh, Kussmaul identified uh, something called agrammatism, which is a grammatical production disorder. He described it as an ability and inability to grammatically form words and to order them syntactically in a sentence. Um, in 1914, Kleist uh, uh, talked about agrammatism as well uh, and gave a bit more detail. Uh, the basic trait of agrammatism, he said, is the simplification and coarsening of word sequences. Complicated compound sentences, that is subordination of clauses are not built. Uh, the patients only speak in small primitive mini sentences if they continue to create sentences at all. All less necessary words, especially pronouns and particles are reduced or eliminated. Um, now he also talked about another type of grammatical production deficit, which is something that has not been studied deeply, um, but something that we're returning to, which is paragrammatism, a second type of grammatical production deficit. In paragrammatism, he said, the ability to create word orders is not abolished, but phrases and sentences are often wrongly chosen and thereby amalgamate and contaminate each other. Phrases and sentence constructions are not completed. Uh, the spoken expression is not simplified overall, instead also conditioned by strong overproduction of word sequences. It swells to, my favorite phrase, confused sentence monsters. So let me give you an example. You should be able to hear. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people with them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. But they'll save in the moment. He'll have water for soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to. We will sort it right here and they'll save their hands right there for them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the iPad that we were doing, we um, like here. I like my change for me and change hands for me. It was happy. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them. With them, I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was barely good and happy. And I played golf and hit other trees. We play out with the hands. We save a lot of hands on hold for people, for us, other hands. I don't know what you get, but I talk with a lot of hands for him. Sometime. When I talk of any more to say it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I hope the world lasts for you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Have a good day. So you can hear he was quite fluent. Um, and grammatical constructions were all present and seemed all fine if you weren't listening closely, but um, there was a lot of uh, grammatical sentence monsters, essentially. Um, here's just some other examples from other studies of this. Um, you could also see some evidence of his comprehension problem. This is kind of typical of severe Wernicke's aphasia or sensory aphasia, so-called. Um, so in 1970, so that was back identified back in the 19 teens. In 1976, um, a, a, 
new bit of information came about by my former advisor, uh, Edgar Zurif, and his uh, collaborator, Alfonso Karamatsa. Uh, and they noted that people with agrammatic Broca's aphasia, that is people who have agrammatism in production, also tended to, to have agrammatic comprehension, that is difficulty comprehending syntactically complex uh, sentences. Um, and like I said, it co-occurs with expressive agrammatism and is typical of people with Broca's aphasia. Um, so here you have what looked like a general syntactic deficit. They have both expressive agrammatism and receptive agrammatism. Um, it implicated Broca's area because if you reason that people with Broca's aphasia have damage to Broca's area, then what that means is that syntax is localized to Broca's area. And that was the, the formula that people were operating on um, at this time. Now, if they could jump in a time machine, fast forward to 2015, they would know that chronic Broca's aphasia isn't just tied to Broca's area. It, uh, in fact, involves Broca's region as well as Wernicke's area, which we know is involved in other uh, functions. So um, there was that caveat, but nonetheless, we'll continue the story. Um, this focus on agrammatic comprehension or this observation um, led to an almost exclusive focus on, on uh, receptive syntax rather than expressive syntax, which only now is starting to be studied uh, more systematically, um, uh, likely because it's much easier to study, it's much more constrained. Um, in 1983, though, after uh, these claims were ga gaining a lot of steam of an overarching agrammatism or syntactic deficit, Myrna Schwartz and Ellie Safran and Marshall Leinberger published a seminal uh, study where they took people with agrammatic aphasia and asked whether they could uh, gener or make grammaticality judgments. They shouldn't be able to if they've lost syntax. Um, and they found that they could. Um, so this changed a term in this formula. Um, uh, so it's not a general syntactic deficit, and that should negate the, um, the equal sign here. So syntax is not in Broca's area. That's what you would think would happen. But shortly after that um, was the invasion of the functional brain scanners. And this changed everything. And uh, one of the first studies, if not the first study on syntax was by Karen Stronswald and David Kaplan uh, and colleagues, uh, where they had people um, uh, reading center embedded constructions, subtracted outright branching, so more complex syntax versus less complex syntax in a PET scan and look to see what brain area activated. And lo and behold, the only active area was Broca's area in the left hemisphere. And um, the title of the paper says it all, localization of syntactic comprehension by positron emission tomography. Um, this was kind of a mic drop moment for uh, functional imaging and syntax. It seemed like it, the Broca's area equals syntax um, equality had to be true, but it didn't erase the previous uh, observations. We still had this formula that seemed to indicate that syntax wasn't in Broca's area. And how did that affect things? Well, functional imaging just kind of mowed over the older lesion work and we just got um, kind of um, entranced by these pretty pictures and ignored the past work. Um, nonetheless, this basic finding has replicated many times. If you do a simple meta-analysis, um, here's one that I did with Neurosynth a little while ago on the term sentence comprehension and look to see what brain areas are associated with sentence comprehension. You see uh, plenty of activity in Broca's area here. Um, so there's no controversy about that. It does activate um, during sentence comprehension. Um, and there have been many claims about the relation between Broca's area and syntax. So uh, here's, some, here's a title, a syntactic specialization of, for Broca's area, um, distributed cortical networks for syntax processing, Broca's area as the common denominator. Um, here's a claim from Grzynski and Federici, hierarchical syntactic structures must be constructed from sequential input. That's just a fact. Uh, these computations are supported by Broca's area, so uh, identifying two sub-regions of Broca's area. Uh, so pretty strong claims. Um, but then lesion studies started emerging, uh, both involving syntactic comprehension and production. And interestingly, they tell a modality-dependent story. So remember the whole interesting claim about agrammatism was that it was an overarching syntactic uh, ability or deficit. Uh, involving both expressive and receptive syntax. Uh, but the modern lesion data tells a different story. So if you look at production studies, uh, 
So this is uh, localizing aspects of agromatic production. You get frontal areas uh, being implicated. Um, and if you look at comprehension, including agromatic comprehension, you get posterior areas uh, being implicated. So you get this modality or expressive receptive difference in syntactic ability based on lesion work. So this still does tie Broca's area to syntax, but more for production than comprehension. Um, and importantly, um, they tell a modality dependent story, which isn't inconsistent with functional MRI data. Um, so it's not that functional MRI data points exclusively to frontal Broca's region. It, it also points to fairly consistent sentence or syntactic effects in the posterior supratemporal sulcus, middle temporal gyrus region. So that's important to, to recognize. Um, so just to summarize in um, very simplified form, functional imaging shows um, basically uh, for receptive syntax, both frontal and posterior areas involved, expressive syntax the same. So the picture from functional imaging looks a bit more networky, everything's involved in everything. Whereas the lesion work, which can tell you something about causal relationships as opposed to just what's activated, um, tells a modality dependent story. Um, so given that most models of how, what the syntact, how the syntactic system is organized assumes a, 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 you know, a syntactic system that's doing you know, whatever it is you think syntax is doing, the same for production and comprehension, this view is inconsistent with um, these observations. And so there are two, op faced with this apparent contradiction, there are two things you can say. One is, um, is that we need to rethink things, and that's my tendency. Uh, uh, the other view is to say that, well, receptive syntax isn't really using syntax, it's something else. And that, um, in discussions with, say, Peter Hagort, that seems to be the position that he's adopting. That the reason why you get this dissociation is that posterior areas can achieve um, you know, uh, um, comprehension without using syntax. I'm not sure that's the right way to think about it. So this brings us to the new model that uh, William Matchin and I have been developing. Um, uh, so again, the starting point is this comprehension production asymmetry, um, which is predicted by the dual stream models um, and finds empirical support as I just reviewed. And again, this asymmetry between production and comprehension is naturally explained by sensory motor control architectures or using these kind of architectures for the language network. So just to remind you again, um, motor planning uses sensory targets, um, uh, whereas perception and comprehension can manage without uh, these dorsal stream systems. So this makes sense. This kind of um, asymmetry makes a lot of sense from motor control architecture standpoint. And here's the here's the thing that I've been considering. Um, so in developing this model, so we split the, these layers of the phonological layer into multiple subcomponents following a, a, a sensory motor architecture. And I always wondered when I drew this box, whether this could actually be split into two as well, or does it suddenly, you know, is this where things kind of are unified and amodal and so on? Um, and I left it like this because I just didn't know. But now um, the idea is that maybe um, this intermediate word lemma level is split into two parts. And that's the question. So here's the basic idea. Um, uh, this, re this level is representing lemma-like stuff. So it's not phonological. It's not semantic. It's something in between. And typical assumptions uh, and, and evidence in psycholinguistics with respect to lemmas is that not only is it just word stuff, this in-between stuff, but it also contains bits of syntactic information. So we can think of this lemma level as being um, something like what would be contained in a lexical-based grammar, um, uh, an enriched lexicon that contains little treelets or something like that. Um, so where is this area that we're talking about? Well, remember the production study where we had this posterior MTG region um, that was unique to comprehension. Um, and what is it actually doing? Well, Brzezinski and Federici tell us, um, they, the first uh, part of this quote, hierarchical syntactic structures must be constructed from sequential input. And so here's the idea that this is where um, hierarchical lexical syntactic um, information is represented. Um, so when speech input is coming in, you get a stream of morphemes. Um, that are linear, linearized by the person who's doing the talking. And so the system can just register the order of these things. It doesn't have to compute it. It can just represent that order that's provided by the input. 
and then access the lemmas associated with each input and use that order information to compute the hierarchy. How it's doing this, we don't know. Um, there are psycholinguistic models out there that have um, made some progress in this, but that's the general idea. Uh, and then from there, uh, you can get to compositional semantic understanding of um, utterances. Now on the production side, uh, we're going from a concept or some event structure that we might wanna talk about. Um, you can access the lemmas associated with the entities involved, maybe the action that's involved, and you can compute a hierarchy that doesn't contain, uh, it's nonlinear, it doesn't contain the sequence. And the sequence is not provided for free. It's just coming from a, a, a nonlinear conceptual representation. You access its hierarchical structure and relation, uh, relation between the lemmas or the bits of morphemes. Um, and, uh, and then you've got to compute the, the, the linear sequence. So how does, where does that happen? How does that happen? Um, the idea is that the sequence is being um, computed uh, in a different region. N namely, you do some sort of morphosyntactic sequencing operation, um, which can then be used as, uh, uh, parenthetically, as a high-level working memory pro for sentence processing, which may be why frontal areas activate. So the, the idea is that this is Broca's area, and you need this area to do the sequencing, which makes sense more generally, because if you do any kind of sequencing task, whether it's finger tapping or whatever, you tend to get um, frontal activation. So frontal systems seem to be quite good at, at sequencing, computing sequences. Um, and so this is the basic idea that this region is um, living in and around Broca's area. Um, for those of you who care about the uh, white matter, this connection is likely outer arcuate again, this is inner arcuate, um, and so on. So the basic uh, neurology of syntax is this, different um, aspects of syntax involve different connected areas. So it's not that, um, it's not, we're kind of decomposing syntax into subcomponents involving linear sequencing versus hierarchies, which is uh, very general for those of you who are syntacticians, I apologize for reducing that whole uh, domain to something so simple, um, but we are working in neuroscience, so we have to simplify some of the details. Um, so high level sensory, that is temporal stuff uh, versus a motor, uh, uh, motor areas are, are involved in representing different aspects of syntax. So um, on this side, on the, on the temporal lobe side, you have hierarchical syntax, um, which uh, is associated with paragrammatism. Um, the idea is uh, severe sentence comprehension deficit uh, because you're not able to get um, uh, translate the linear sequence into a hierarchical representation. Um, it affects both receptive and expressive syntax because you need to access these hierarchical relationships both for comprehension and for production. Um, on the frontal lobe side, um, this is a system that's involved in linear sequencing at the, at the morpheme level. Um, it's associated with agrammatism because uh, if you're not able to take those hierarchical representations and translate them into a sequence, you're just gonna end up um, spewing out a couple words at a time or uh, have a lot of difficulty getting anything out. Um, you have minimal sentence comprehension deficits, um, except to the extent that your uh, stimuli involve very complex things that people may need to rehearse to themselves um, to uh, get it, um, um, to extract the meaning. Um, and it, aff it affects predominantly expressive syntax. Um, so notice that this makes a, a, a prediction that we should see um, a grammatism, which we which is attested in the literature, associated with frontal areas and paragrammatism associated with um, posterior areas. Now, this has been studied a bit. Um, this had not been studied previously. Paragrammatism is associated with Wernicke's aphasia, which tends to have lesions back here, so that's partial confirmation. Um, but in a recent study, we took a group of stroke patients and uh, rated them in terms of their uh, the extent of their agrammatism versus paragrammatism and map those two vectors onto uh, uh, the lesions associated with um, these uh, disabilities and found um, uh, essentially what we predicted. Um, these are just two different ways of doing the mapping. This takes account of lesion um, volume. This takes account of lesion volume and a baseline fluency. Um, and so, but they both point in the same direction. Agrammatism is associated with frontal lobe damage, paragrammatism is associated with posterior uh, damage, both 
are syntactic deficits, we argue, and other people have argued, implicating different regions. So uh, here's the final slide, I believe, um, and which is a generalized sensory motor like that is homologous architecture for language. So I'm, again, I'm not reducing language architectures um, to uh, sensory motor systems. That would be like saying that all a bat needed was a forelimb uh, and it could fly. No, it needs to evolve the extra bits in order to uh, take flight, even though the, there's a homologous relationship between our forelimbs and the bat's wings. Um, so language can be as uh, unique as it needs to be, um, but it can still be homologous to sensory motor systems. We're taking advantage of the architecture here. Um, so uh, you have a, a phonological level, a morphosyntactic level that has both, uh, quote, sensory and motor uh, aspects, that is regions that are more closely aligned with sensory systems versus motor systems, linked up to a conceptual network, um, which uh, is color coded here re uh, reflects the different regions that seem to be involved. Um, and um, that's the basic idea. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to post a link to my slides um, through my Twitter account. So check there if you'd like a link to the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg, for this great talk. Um, okay, now we are going to start the question and answer session with invited discussant Elliot Murphy. Elliot Murphy is a research fellow at the McGovern Medical School, University of Texas, and has already participated in the series Sabralinha ao Vivo with the lecture A Neurocomputational Perspective on Syntax. Thanks, Elliot. Yeah, thank you, Miguel. Uh, okay, hi, Greg. Hey, Elliot. Okay. Um, so yeah, firstly, thank you very much for having me join the event. Um, we're looking forward to discussing this with you. you. You just presented a huge body of really impressive work, so it's kind of hard to narrow down too much on what to talk about. But um, you know, you talked a lot about phonological processing. You talked about um, the visual system and parallel architecture assumptions. But I want to kind of um, maybe question the idea that your model like preserves a lot of the core of uh, the representational architecture of linguistics. And I wanna maybe push you just a little bit on that. Um, so on that note, which aspect of your model would you say um, in connection to um, syntax, would you say is the area where you'd like to maybe conduct uh, further research on, the area that you think is maybe, you know, uh, could do with additional support? I'm guessing maybe it might be the, um, the SBT region and its dynamics and what it's actually doing, the how question, but yeah, I'm just kind of curious what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, all of it, this, my approach is very top down. So I'm, I'm interested in identifying, you know, like we do the outside of the puzzle first and work on the details. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. And the, the limitation of that approach is any detailed question is gonna go unanswered. So you're absolutely right that I, I haven't said anything that in itself preserves much of the linguistic structure as we understand it from linguistics, other than there's some phonology and some morphology maybe and some syntax, which we already know. So that doesn't help linguistics at all. What we're trying to do here though, is understand how the brain is doing it. And that's, we have to simplify the problem. So, um, so I mean, even at the level of, of uh, you know, of phonology, it's it's unclear what what's actually being represented, um, and we don't know. Um, and the same is true of syntax. So all of it needs lots more detail. Um, SPT is certainly some one region that I've been trying to get grant funding to support a detailed study, um, as as I think you know, Elliot. Um, and um, you know, we're once we get that, we can do a lot of interesting things. But um, we're in some ways where, you know, once we start digging in, we realize that we're almost at that point where now that we know we have a, a, a sketch and we're starting to look at some of the details and now we realize that we really don't know much about how it's working. Um, but the goal is to try to outline the problem and maybe that gets linguists um, to think about, you know, how theoretical models or approaches might change if we think about um, these representational systems as being parceled out into partially modally uh, dependent um, regions. So that, from a linguistic standpoint, is one of the most interesting things that I can think of. So um, a related question here, which aspects of um, the brain dynamics literature, so maybe with five people like David Popel and the entrainment low frequency stuff, 
which aspect of that work do you think is maybe most compatible and relevant to the kind of architecture that you've provided? Because you mentioned, you know, um, the fact that people who research brain dynamics uh, need to appreciate that it occurs somewhere in the brain, which is true. Um, but it's also equally true that once you have a robust, like, cartographic model informed by lesion research, you need to ultimately uh, provide a kind of how perspective. So is there yeah. anything in that literature that you think is uh, approachable or, you know, interesting to you? Well, I, I think, um, I mean, as you know, one of the problems with a lot of the um, brain dynamic research oscillations and, su and such is that it, most of them, um, you know, some of your work notwithstanding, is done from outside the skull. And so you're looking at um, patterns that may be coming from different network subcomponents or you don't really know what the internal details are. So it may be hard to, to draw conclusions. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you know, if we can understand the architecture and then we can look or have at least hypotheses about the architecture. And then, you know, so we have a, a map that suggests different areas involved in different bits of syntax. Then I think probably, you know, uh, coupling of these uh, oscillation dynamics is probably part of the way or a reflection at least of how brain areas are communicating with each other. And then we can go look to see, you know, what's actually happening in there. I'm not sure that will tell us anything um, right away, but it's another piece of evidence that, you know, might lead us to some interesting um, observations. I just, I, I, I both, my main point is that both bits are important. Looking at the dynamics, obviously we want to know how these areas are communicating, what they're actually doing computationally. Um, and, but just looking at reflections of those computations and the dynamics isn't enough either. We need to understand how they're situated and how what subparts are interacting with one another. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned a lot about the, uh, the motor system and, and, and motor areas of the brain and how they might be relevant in, in various aspects of the model. I'm wondering what you make of the possible parallelisms between uh, the syntax of actions, so motor planning, hierarchical, uh, you know, looped subroutines of motor actions and natural language syntax. So around um, like 2013, 2015-ish, there was a series of papers published uh, kind of speculating that um, the computational similarities and also the neural basis of things uh, like action and, and syntax uh, might be kind of uh, quite closely connected. So natural language has um, things like locality constraints, uh, you know, the like F dependency, C command, binary principles, and all the rest of it, kind of non-local, non-local operation. Whereas an action, you don't have that. You just have, you know, reaching for the cuff and then you can either complete the action or you can stop halfway through. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, like, you know, there are other certain properties of language, like binarity, binary branching, uh, kind of constraints on computation that might be like relaxed in other domains, like mathematics or music, where you don't have that kind of stringent computational constraint. Uh, so maybe that might be more best thought of in terms of like a domain specific constraint on this kind of fundamental generic combinatorial operation. But well, action obviously involves combination, right? Motor planning involves combining things um, in some way. I mean, maybe not a very rich structure, but you're at least combining multiple actions or multiple, you know, decisions. Is there some kind of interesting parallel there? I think there could be, um, absolutely. So, I mean, we know that that uh, linguistic abilities, including syntax, had to evolve out of a brain that wasn't, you know, that was fairly complicated in terms of its you know, motor control abilities, which presumably in included um, tool making abilities and things that required some planning and sequencing and all these sorts of things. Um, and, and so I, I think there are some prerequisites or precursors, I should say, of um, these kinds of abilities in other domains that we can see in ourselves, um, as well as in other species. Um, and I think those should be explored seriously. At the same time, so when I talk about these sensory motor architectures and things like that, oftentimes I'll get misinterpreted um, where people think that what I'm claiming is that syntax is just reducible to motor control or something like that. That's not the claim at all. The idea that I wanna explore is that um, these sorts of non-linguistic abilities that include some sequencing, maybe some simple hierarchies that you mentioned are the homo homologs to syntax um, or a starting point for evolving or developing something much more complex that includes C command and long distance binding and all these other sorts of principles that could be as unique to language as Chomsky says they are, for example, that could hold. And these arguments about um, neurocomputational sensory motor control architectures could also be true. Um, it's just that those more complicated, rich things that we find in natural language just evolved in within the constraints of these uh, generalized architectures. 
And then it could be that something absolutely brand new happened too. That's a possibility. Although from an evolutionary standpoint, that's less likely. Okay, uh, so another one of the details that I wanted to kind of push you on is uh, the assumption that words are used as a kind of tool, a kind of unit in syntactic computation. So in recent linguistic literature, distributive morphology, and uh, genitive grammar, um, there's also an interesting development which suggests that words are also the output of syntactic computation, right? So current thinking in linguistics kind of assumes that um, the initial combinatorial processing, well, a lot of the initial combinatorial processing actually takes place within the lexicon itself. So you, know, you merge a root, uh, like run, with its syntactic form of features to generate an appropriate morphology and a categorical feature. So a word like run could be a noun or it could be a verb, right, depending on, on what you do with it. Um, so a word, yeah, like running, I guess, you, you could say John is running, it's already a hierarchical object, the word running. Mm -hmm. But running is, is actually has a pretty rich hierarchy because you have the head run and then a kind of ancillary component, ing. Um, but you said that um, a grammatism and linear morphosyntax occurs or is more um, uh, re receptive in Broca's area. So does this mean that any syntactically relevant morphological process should call upon Broca's area, even though um, it's assumed that this, this business of morphological merging is already done before kind of syntax proper appears, right? And is this different, is this different from like other forms of elementary syntax, like phrase structure? So like an adjective noun, phrase like a red book, that's a, that's a very primitive operation. But mm -hmm. then there's also that element of like what Jack Nivak calls, you know, morphological unification where there's, there's also a kind of merging process going on. Yeah, I, I think like just to take your example of running, uh, let's assume it's a complex hierarchical structure already. I would assume that that kind of hierarchical relationship can already be coded in the posterior part of the brain. Um, but it's not necessarily sequence. It's the, you have the two morphemes and they're in some relationship, um, you know, some, some hierarchical relationship. And it's the frontal areas that have to actually put the, you know, the, the head and the, the affects uh, in the right order. Um, and so that, that's, how, that's how I think of it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a problem with um, words being something that aren't necessarily associated with um, those posterior areas. So my, appro my approach in general is that I, I think the basic linguistic research is gonna inform a lot about what's actually happening in these regions that I talk about. So I'm not committed to one view or another and I don't think that the way I'm thinking necessarily restricts people to one view or another. Um, strongly, other than perhaps um, this kind of approach may be more consistent with a, a, a rich lexicon as opposed to, um, a, you know, a, a, a strong isolated syntax, um, those sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, so that's how I think about it. The sequencing, the actual sequencing of the morphemes and the phrases is something that, for the most part, is going to depend on frontal circuits and give rise to agrammatism when damaged. Whereas the, the ability to structure the hierarchy is something that's associated with posterior areas and when damaged in production will produce this kind of sentence monster uh, like effect. Um, okay, so in the in the classic broker Wernicke model, there's not much said about um, syntactic complexity, obviously because that notion wasn't really around at the time. Uh, you propose that uh, PMDG, PSDS is responsible for what you're calling lexical syntactic uh, kind of hierarchies. So kind of following on from that, how lexicalist is PMTG and how uh, syntactic is it? So semantic representations seem to be you know, distributed across the brain, depending on whatever concept is involved. So how are these particular distributed representations called upon by this particular hook? Like what's, what, what's the actual calling process, the kind of readout process? Yeah. Uh, I, the way I think of it is, um, I think of it kind of in terms of the deep neural network kind of um, architecture where you have a, a nonlinear mapping between phonology and, and higher level uh, uh, conceptual representations. Um, and that requires some intermediate level, probably multiple intermediate levels. And that's, those are the regions or the kind of computational levels that I'm referring to when I talk about word, lexical, lemma, all those sorts of things. And I use them interchangeably because I don't know what the right representational format is. I don't think we know. Um, 
but I do think of it as kind of just a one stage in the mapping. And it takes the form that it does um, because that's the kind of, um, that's what's needed in order to get to perform the nonlinear uh, mapping. Um, so I don't have any brilliant ideas about what it's actually doing other than um, there's something in between that's coding what it needs to, to get from a, you know, a sequence of morphemes or a phonological structure to a conceptual structure. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you, you also mentioned um, about halfway through your talk, um, homologues with non-human primates, which is a really cool topic. Obviously, you and me have slightly different perspectives on uh, language evolution, but I wanted to kind of ask, where is the point of, um, what you see as the point of like computational divergence in the human natural language system? This is actually kind of similar to a question that, I'm, that I'll ask soon from William Matthew. Um, but do we need to have a non-homologous structure if we also have a novel computational process? Or can we just assume that all novel aspects of syntax, whatever they are, can actually be derived from kind of domain general procedures that might be rooted in some of the things that you were talking about in the, in, in the model that you mentioned? I don't see them as domain general procedures. Um, I see them as homologous in the, the biological sense. So they could be highly specialized and still be homologous, like a bat wing and, and our forelimb. Our, mm -hmm. our fingers are highly specialized for fine motor control, um, but it's still homologous with the little bits at the end of a, of a bat wing. Um, so I don't, I think talking about this in terms of, you know, domain general is, is can be misleading, although I get your point. Um, kind of related to those other, other functions. And I think it's also important to, to recognize that um, just like species, we, we're related to our, you know, ape cousins or our, um, you know, old world monkey distant cousins and, and so on. Um, but we didn't evolve from them. We evolved from a common ancestor and then evolution happened after that. So the way, what I'm interested in exploring is the idea that there was some ancestral, say, motor control circuit that did what it did. And one branch we maybe had a gene replication or something and that enabled one branch to go down the linguistic line, evolve whatever it does there. The other branch continues evolving perhaps in terms of developing better fine motor control uh, and of the, of the articulate, the fingers and so on. Um, and so they're related, but they're, they each could be quite specialized and very different. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I think it. And in terms of the evolution, I don't, um, you know, I, I think the stages um, that, for example, Tecumseh Fitch talks about uh, are reasonable, probably our best guess in terms of, you know, when things were happening and how long ago it was. And I, I think syntax is the part that is the least uh, well understood. That's the hardest part, because it does look like there's a lot of highly specialized things that don't show up in you know, baking cookies or something. Um, but um, so, you know, and, and the question of whether that detail evolved within the constraints of a sensory motor architecture, which I think it did, um, or whether it just did something completely new, like um, what Chomsky thinks is, I, th I think it's an open question, but our first um, null hypothesis should be that it's related to something that we already have. It's not brand new. Um, and it follows some of these architectures. At least that's, for me, the, the best way going forward to, to generate new hypotheses that can be tested. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask about um, a really cool idea that you mentioned to do with um, the role of IFG. You documented the history of, of Broca's area and how it's changed over the years. And um, there's this idea that you mentioned of portions of IFG kind of acting as a, like a syntactic memory crutch or memory buffer of some sort. So what, what type of memory exactly are we talking about? Because obviously, you know, linguists would call upon some kind of basic, like push down automata, a finite state grammar, or something maybe beyond that is needed. Because mm -hmm. like in principle, it should be, you know, linguists often talk about mildly context sensitive grammars to deal with things like cross serial dependencies and Swiss German, all these kind of really complex structures that some languages can generate. Not all mm -hmm. languages do kind of call upon that, you know, really high level kind of their memory. But um, in principle, where would that, higher order language specific memory process be stored and what kind of, how does it differentiate from other finite state uh, memory buffers which may either not be in Broca's area or might be somewhere else? Yeah, so William Matchin has, has, uh, has developed the idea of a kind of syntactic working memory a bit more than I have. Um, so give him credit for thinking harder about that than me. Um, my initially, um, one of the questions I had, um, and I, I tend to, 
to think simply, answer the simplest question first and then try to get more complicated later. So one of the things that um, we tried to do early on is when people were seeing all these activations for um, complex sentences minus simple sentences in Broca's area, one question I had was how much of that uh, was due to simple articulatory rehearsal, like the phonological loop. Um, because if you put someone in a scanner and ask them to, comp uh, to um, comprehend a simple sentence, you know, they may not have that much trouble. Then you ask them to comprehend a more complex sentence and they're performing a task, they may mentally rehearse the sentence to make sure they're getting it. And so we did an experiment a while back where we suppressed that articulatory rehearsal and found that uh, a good chunk of the activation in Broca's area went away. Um, that is, that it's probably due to articulatory rehearsal. Um, as far as I know, we're the only group that's ever explicitly controlled for articulatory rehearsal in a sentence processing task. And I would like to see more people doing that um, in general to see how much of it is just that. That said, there are some of that activation was not explainable in terms of phonological working memory. And so that raised the question of whether there was something uh, that could be used as a form of syntactic working memory um, that is, is basically a sequencing. So, and the logic is basically this. If a part of Broca's area is capable of generating linear sequences from hierarchical representations, um, what you could do if you needed to keep a chunk of syntax in your head, um, you could you know, listen to the sentence, code its phonological form, um, access the hierarchical structure. And once you have that, then Broca's area could generate a, a linear sequence for you. And presumably you could use that as a higher order phonological loop to maintain information at some other level. Um, so I think of it as um, how it relates to push down automata or whatever, I'm not so sure, but I think of the, I think of it analogous to the phonological loop where you have a phonological store, uh, which is, which I think of as just a kind of echoic memory at the phonological level that is capable of holding a bit of information you can recode that articulatorily and then just cycle through that where you're just reactivating that phonological store, which is in the posterior part of the brain. So if you could do that at the level of the hierarchy, you can activate a hierarchical representation of a chunk of syntax, run it through the frontal, line frontal linear sequencing system and refresh the contents of that, um, you know, that hierarchical representation and keep it active and use that as a crutch for comprehension or replaying information in your head if you if you miss something or whatever. So, so that's generally how I think about it. In terms of the details, I don't have concrete ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that definitely meshes well with a lot of ideas from him. So people like Luigi Rizzi have this idea of, um, I think he calls it the, the two or three mage system, where non-human primates have the ability to do one mage. They can mm -hmm. concatenate, you know, two roots together. Um, mm -hmm. But then uh, what's unique about human language is that you have that, the additional memory proofs that you mentioned, which provides this additional storage that you can provide. You can, you know, merge a phrase and then ship it off and then merge that phrase with another phrase. But it's obviously constrained by, by working memory mm -hmm. capacity, which is why you do all the classic kind of Chomsky and Miller examples about working memory constraints. So that's probably, yeah. that sounds kind of compatible with I yeah, guess, what you're saying. It does. I mean, I think it's, it's having the ability to code hierarchies of relationships between elements is one step beyond a phonological store, which is just a, a linear sequence. And yeah, so you could, you could get to that next level by, uh, by activating or evolving a, a hierarchical system that could chunk in, a, in an important uh, way like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so um, I'm wondering what you also think about particular parsing models, because you, you've invoked a lot of like, models of syntax um, but it's unclear whether you're invoking models of computational competence um, or whether you mean to invoke like syntactic parsing models like the work of, you know, Colin Phillips or Barrick and Stabler who kind of try and implement uh, computational competence models in kind of real-time real, real -time language processing. So a lot of the concepts that you've talked about are kind of atheoretical, right, which is actually good because it allows it to be more compatible with a lot of different theories and we're obviously not at the stage where we can kind of adjudicate between different you know, right. construction grammar versus HTTPSD or whatever. Um, but even so, you know, even lemmas and morphemes, which are pretty simple, they still tie in quite tightly to specific, you know, psycholinguistic models. Um, they're not completely atheoretical. So I'm kind of curious what you think, if, if at all, if you have any views about competing, you know, passing models. 
Yeah, I try to strike a balance between being, I don't want to be a theoretical. I want to use the theories that come out of other domains um, and use those for inspiration for thinking about the problem, but neither do I, I mean, we, we know that we don't know what the right parsing model is or the right psycholinguistic model is. So I don't want to fully commit to one and I want it to be general enough that I can make progress even if we don't know how language works at, you know, at the theoretical level. Um, so, um, yeah, it, in terms of parsing models, uh, you know, I think we talked a bit about um, a model by Lewis and I'm forgetting the other author, which was interesting because one argument they made was that the ability to um, code sequences is quite limited and you need to offload that stuff to another system to do this chunking. So I found that quite interesting. I don't, you know, and it's compatible with, with what um, we've been talking about um, with respect to the models we're developing. But, um, you know, I, my hope is that, um, that providing a framework for how this system might be a broad framework for how the architecture of the system might be organized will inspire people doing psycholinguistics or theoretical linguistics to, to think about some other hypotheses about how things might be organized. Um, and then with respect to competence and performance, um, I, I wonder whether that distinction um, needs to be weakened a little bit in the sense that, um, I mean, when, when I was taking syntax courses and stuff back in grad school, you always learn, of course, that these, these syntactic models are not performance models because I was interested in parsing and taking theoretical syntax and government and binding back in the day. And, um, and I would always wonder, well, how does that work when you're actually processing stuff? And my linguist instructors would be like, no, 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 stop thinking that way. That's not, <laughs> that's not helpful. It, this is a, a representational view, but I think we might be able to make some interesting progress if we assume that the syntactic mechanisms uh, evolved for a purpose, for a process, and that we're kind of abstracting uh, a general knowledge competence that may be somewhat artificial. Um, uh, and so I would like to see more theoretical approaches, um, and I'm speaking for, as someone who's not going to do this and doesn't know, as, you know exactly how it could be done, but think about it in terms of, you know, maybe it's modality dependent um, and we need to think about theoretical structures in that context. Um, so, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know how helpful that would be, but just, you know, an idea to throw out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think you may have um, potentially answered this next question in, in your talk, but um, I'm kind of curious what you think about it. I'm, I'm curious what you think about planning hierarchical objects to be linearly externalized and which portions of your model would be appropriate for that process. So how and where does that happen? So in, in linguistics, there's a lot of work on um, people like Richard Kane have talked about um, his linear correspondence action, where you kind of try and map on um, which particular nodes in your hierarchical structure are to be linearized first, which ones come first and second and third. So the LCA says that hierarchical structure in language maps universally onto a particular uh, surface linearization, specify mm -hmm. head complement, right? Um, but other people disagree. Other people think that hierarchical order has no direct um, kind of relation to which nodes are, are linearly organized at, at externalization. So this transformational process obviously needs better grounding in real time, you know, dynamics. But I'm kind of curious if you think that your kind of lesion literature could maybe, uh, you know, point us in a general direction. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we can help resolve those debates. Neuroscience is historically really bad at helping with psycholinguistic or linguistic debates. But um, in general, the, the, the general question about where this sort of thing is happening, it's the interaction between these hierarchical representations that are living in the posterior temporal lobe with uh, some set of systems in and around Broca's area that are doing a linear sequencing. That Whatever that mapping is, and we don't even know whether that's mediated by anything. Is there an intermediate area that is uh, performing some extra computation uh, in the interaction of these two uh, broad regions? Um, but that, that would be the part of the network that's doing that sort of thing, according to the model. I don't know in terms of the, de the details um, yeah. or, or whether it would be instructive um, to look at lesion data. Right, because that's the kind of area where you might expect a kind of more dynamical lower level perspective might be able to at least implement it, mm -hmm. maybe not mm -hmm. possibly show. Um, yeah. Okay, I also wanted to ask you a little bit briefly about um, events and entities. So you talked about entities and events um, in your model and also in other models, um, you have ATL encoding for entities 
um, I guess IPL or Angular Gyrus around the coding thematic relations, so events basically. Um, events contain entities and not the other way around. Um, there's kind of an assumption in linguistics that categorization of phrases or labeling or whatever has been argued to kind of also shape meaning. So phrasal meaning is very different from lexical meaning, right? It's a different type of meaning. Uh, in the same way that, you know, one of the classic examples is a red boat. You know, a red boat is a boat that's red. It's not a red quality that has boat-like features. But this is also true for events though, right? So um, the phrase John Ram means that there's an event X and its participant is John. It doesn't mean that there's a special kind of John that exhibits, uh, you know, running like properties or whatever. Um, so where does this particular structure come from? Because it's one thing to construct hierarchy. You've mentioned hierarchy a few times, but um, hierarchy doesn't really give you that much in terms of what you need to, you know, to do certain things, right? You have a hierarchy, but then you also need a kind of categorization mechanism. So you, you, you construct structure, but then you need to identify it in a certain way. Um, so structure without an identity is not really anything. It's not natural language. It's uh, it's it's action. It's it's you know visual processing. Whatever. There's, there's all sorts of hierarchies in cognition, but uh, it's the kind of it's the categorization of hierarchies, and not just the hierarchy in itself, which delivers the kind of core you know universal principle that uh, natural language kind of needs to, to to get going. So I'm kind of curious where that particular because that 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 whole notion of categorization, kind of top down you know frontal kind of control and monitoring of business that sounds pretty broker style. But obviously, it doesn't really. That's not what you're saying, really, right? I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, I think of that stuff as being um, kind of outside the language system. It's it's the I think of it as a conceptual network, and it may be one of the things that had to evolve in our hominin ancestors um, uh, that required syntax to be so complicated. Um, so if we have a rich conceptual structure that can do all sorts of things like you were mentioning, represent, so you represent individual entities that can have fairly specific properties, like you said, red boat, you know, whatever, there's, there's a lot of specificity there, particular people, um, in, individuals, one animal that you know versus another animal that you know, there's lots of details and richness that is in those entity conceptual representations. And then you need to know something about how those things interact, like, you know, if you see an entity that you can categorize, because that's something you'll need to do as a, as a species. Um, and then you need to know how those categories of things will interact. And not only those categories, but the individual um, specific instances of things that you recognize, people that you know, animals that you've seen before, a tree that's going to bloom at a particular time of year. Um, you need to know how they're going to behave in certain situations. Is that lion going to be in this particular situation likely to be a threat or not? Or, you know, wh where are they looking? What, are the, what, is, what, what is going on in terms of the event structure? And I would imagine that evolving those kinds of abilities, a rich conceptual stru structure that can do combinatorics, that can abstract over a lot of different things, um, is something that probably predates syntax and then syntax evolved um, and, and I know this is different than you know some views um, syntax evolved as the means to link up those rich conceptual structures that have all the that sort of um, you know uh, specification with um, a hierarchy that can then be linearized or do you need to be able to get it out um, and you know talk about it through a, a linear sequencing mechanism so I think of those things as being rather outside the language system and something, an, an interesting deep problem uh, with all the richness that you specified um, uh, that, um, yeah, deserve, you know, deserves study on its own. And, and I don't think what we're talking about yet addresses any deep ideas about that other than acknowledging that there may be a distinction between entity knowledge and event knowledge, which integrates those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, th there is an idea that, you know, um, the evolution of language provided a kind of universal currency um, to kind of conduct cross modular transactions between different cognitive domains. You know, different mm -hmm. in non human primates, cognitive modules are kind of more encapsulated and isolated, whereas in the human brain, they kind of talk to each other much more. There's much more uh, kind of cross transference on. So, mm -hmm. um, what do you say to the idea that, um, you know, you mentioned ATL? ATL is a conceptual binding group. Oops. Um, re recruiting representations kind of cross cort cortically, right? Um, whereas posterior temporal lobes seem to be maybe a kind of like a syntactic lobe uh, responsible for kind of forming what people like Peter Gore would call phrasal templates 
that can be accessed by language external systems in frontal and parietal regions um, for the purposes of you know interpretation or whatever. Um, this kind of nice conceptual binding versus syntactic binding seems to be supported by, by what you're saying, but I don't know if, if, if you agree with that. I'm not sure for the for the anterior part, I think I agree with what how you characterize it. I I, I think the the view that it's doing some that it's a kind of conceptual combinatoric hub makes sense with respect to entities. Uh, the kind of Binder Desai view of, of that region is reasonable to me. Um, the posterior zone, are you talking about like the angular gyrus or something? Oh, sorry, like, like PT. Yeah, PT. Like, like which one? Like STS PMTG. SCS PMTG. Yeah. So I think of I think of that as language specific. So that mm -hmm. is is not where the um, the event structures and the rich conceptual structure at that level is being represented. It's it's the thing that interfaces the two. It's it's lying neatly in between the ATL, which is I think involved in entity representations, and the Angular Gyrus, which is doing something closer to a higher order. Binding, um, linking those event structure relationships to motor plans, to all sorts of other things, um, action sequences, which is also another thing that's represented near there is biological motion areas that can mm -hmm. code information about actions. Um, and so that MTG, PSTS, PMTG area that I think is lemma, syntactic, lexical. <clears throat> is neatly situated between all of those higher order networks and right near phonological networks. And so it's, it's kind of in, in the right place to, to link up the phonological stuff with those other structures. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I think of it. Yeah, it, it is. It's very well, it's very technically well placed to do that kind of process. So, so does that mean that in your model and based on your, your research, a lesion in PSGS, PMPG, would lead to the inability to take like event information from AG and assemble it in a hierarchical fashion. So is that what you find in terms of like the sentences produced by patients? Like do patients actually start talking about one aspect of an event and then just stop talking as you think they're about to kind of embed some extra information to make it a more complex event structure? Does that impact you know their thinking? Um, so like you know patients with Wernicke's area damage, do they internally generate less hierarchically structured thoughts about events and, and things like that? Yeah, that's what's that's what's interesting. I think about um, the direction that we've tried to go, and, and I don't have the answers to your questions. But the fact that you could ask those questions is what's interesting to me because um, uh, we we can look at it. We, there are patients with you know these paragrammatic output deficits, and all we've done so far in studying them because this is a patient group that's largely been ignored, um, uh, you know, and and people haven't heard of paragrammatism. Um, uh, if we can bring that to the table and say, there might be some interesting things we could look at in these cases to answer exactly some of those questions that you've, you've addressed. Um, I have thought about the, does it change their thinking idea? And we've done a, a very blunt study of that so far, just looking again at the relation between intelligence and aphasic deficits, including in cases of fluent aphasia. Um, and at least using a standard, uh, uh, fluid IQ test, the Raven's progressive matrices, there seems to be basically very little relationship between intelligence and any kind of language deficit. So um, the evidence seems to point to, um, you know, damage to these networks that include representation of hierarchies doesn't seem to affect thinking uh, as far as we know, or as far as we've been able to measure. Hmm. So but those, those are great questions to ask. So, so if, if PMF left PMTG is this lexical lexical syntactic interface. Um, where would you say, okay, or rather, what is it interfacing in terms of like actual representations? Is it only part of lexicon uh, represented in PMTG? And other lexical objects are stored cross cortically because the lexicon can be obviously partitioned into different types of features: uh, formal, semantic, syntactic, phonological features. Obviously, a word is just like uh, any given word is just like a grid-like representation of uh, any number of features. There can be words that have a phonology and a semantics, but no syntax, like ouch or hello. There are words that can have a, um, a semantics and a syntax, but no phonology, like uh, you know traces and movement theory and things like that. So this kind of very complex grid-like structure, it seems unlikely to me that it's, it's housed in this kind of very narrow portion of tissue. Or is it more that this area is, like you say, the kind of the interfacer, that the area that does that particular interfacing effect? And, and other aspects of the lexicon are housed properly. 
Yeah, um, I think again, it's an open question. We don't we don't really know, um, and I think more detailed questions should be asked. My my, um, I mean, the strongest claim is that every all all bits of the lexicon, or at least the thing that binds everything together lives in that one spot or that general zone. So that's the strongest claim, easiest to disprove. Let's do the studies to, to try to disprove it and show that it's more complicated, but starting out simpler mm. um, makes it easy to, to make progress because you can show that it's wrong pretty straightforwardly. In general, the way I think about this area is that it is just kind of a binding node in, in you know, to use that terminology, which is that you have a bunch of phonological features which are representing whatever they represent in more dorsal areas, say. And then you have a bunch of semantic features of various types that are represented elsewhere. Um, and the stuff in between is just binding those together. And when you, when you bind them together in the sense that you can map between those spaces, mm -hmm. what emerges out of that is what we call the lexicon. So. I don't think of it, you know, I don't, yeah. So that's basically how I think about it, what it's. Yeah, yeah. So in, in, in fairly recent work of yours, I think it's, is it Walker, Fridrickson and Hickok? I have a forthcoming or in, in the view maybe. I remember you presented some ideas where you say that the semantic network is, uh, you know, ventral ATL, I guess maybe. Um, and also this a certain portion of uh, TPJ. So I'm wondering what the connection is between, you know, elementary phrase, phrase structure building in PSDS PMDG and these other networks, because obviously um, any phrase structure needs to have some kind of conceptual content, semantic content rather, otherwise it's not natural language. Um, even the definite article there has pretty rich semantics, um, even though there's no conceptual content. So mm -hmm. where is the, where are the semantics of function words? You know, things that have, they involve, you know, hierarchical processing, but they're not very conceptually rich structures. Yeah. Um... <sighs> It's a good question. I've thought about function words briefly. I, you know, I think um, Ed Fedorenko has done some work on, you know, function word related things. Um, I'm not sure we know again, and I hate to just say I don't know for most of these questions, but I don't see why function words couldn't have a phonological specification and then map onto whatever they need to map onto through some portion of the same network. Um, so yeah, I don't think that it has to be. Um, I, I think I, the way I think of the network is it's not pigeonholed into one particular kind of, of mapping. It's got to do, it's got to deal with all this stuff. There may be sub net, sub portions of the network that deal with different classes of things. Um, you see, you know, self-organization of neural networks all the time. So there may be some of that going on. Um, I don't really know. I thought you were going to ask about the ventral, like fusiform posterior temporal lobe area that um, Nitin Tandon and his team and I discovered that seemed to be a modal semantic, um, but that's not what you were asking about. Well, I already know the answers to those questions. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, um, yeah, also on that note, I think you actually touched on this, but I wanted to kind of check, you know, you mentioned a lot about particular phonological and phonetic, you know, representation, but I'm kind of curious, um, what about, obviously phonology is, a, is an extremely abstract process. It's uh, the whole underlying representation business, surface versus deep structure, and um, phonology is just as abstract as, you know, syntax or semantics. So in, in the model that you presented at the end of the talk, where would these high order phonological computations um, take place? Right. I, I see them as the interaction of, so, I mean, as you know, most of phonology and most of, most of theoretical in, uh, syntax in general is all about production. Right, so I mean, you ask people, you know, you, you look at how you say things and how you articulate things and you can make um, you know, phonological theories about the underlying structures that are that explain uh, the speech patterns that you see. Syntax is less obviously production based, but you are when you ask for grammaticality judgments, acceptability judgments, you're essentially asking people, not can you understand this, but you're asking them, is this something you would say given your grammar, given your language? So it is theoretical linguistics is basically about production, which is essentially the whole network. Um, so, um, so I see the complexities of any of these levels of representation to be contained within the sensory motor network, sensory motor quotes, I don't mean sensory motor, I mean, you know, that architecture, the, the temporal lobe side versus the frontal lobe side, um, that um, the complexities are somehow in that computation. And the Again, the way I think about it is that there is a computational task that these systems solve. How do you go from 
a an auditory, in the case of speech, sound pattern um, that comes in a sequence, recode it so that you can make your mouth jiggle to reproduce those sounds. That's the computational problem. Uh, the network architecture for solving that problem is built out of existing kind of architectures that can be used, a sensory code, a motor code that has changed so that it can deal with vocal kind of behavior. And the solution to that is what phonologists are studying. It, they're, they're looking at, you know, how does this, how did this thing actually work? I'm trying to, so that's how I think about phonology. And I think the same is true of syntax. So syntax, the problem is going from probably conceptual structures to that thing in between the hierarchical representations to a linear sequence. Syntactic models are all about that. Um, that is, in my view, um, instantiated in the architecture that I outlined today. And so all of the details are in there. It, it's the system that solved that computational problem. The neuroscience doesn't tell us how it solves it. it. It Maybe it specifies little bits and pieces of it now in terms of how broad categories of things might be coded and where and what separate pieces might be interacting. But, um, but I assume it's all within those networks, somehow sub portions, some, you know, some sub dynamics of it. Um, and I should say that I don't, even though I draw these big boxes that correspond to these big things, I don't necessarily think that that's all there is. I'm sure there's internal structure in every box that I draw. Um, but we, uh, you know, if I drew it, people would say, you're crazy. How do you know? And I would say, I don't, I just think it's more complicated. So it doesn't help to, to be more specific than the evidence supports. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously boxology gets, uh, boxology is basically a pejorative term these days, even though there's nothing wrong with drawing boxes, right? If, if you admit that they're more complicated than the simple labeling that you provide, that's sure. completely understandable. And yeah. um, so I might be might be wrong about this, but I think you showed um, an asymmetry in the involvement of PSTS and uh, Broca's area in terms of receptive and uh, expressive agrarianism. So I think you made the conclusion that, again, I might be wrong about this, but I think you made the conclusion that there cannot be an amodal syntactic computation responsible for both because there's no kind of similar underlying neural localization for this. Is that more or less what you were saying? Um, sort of, kind of. I, I mean, I think, uh, and this and the, another paper that William and I are, uh, William Matchin and I are working on. So the long-standing idea about an overarching grammatical deficit, overarching meaning crossing production and comprehension, was agrammatism. You had expressive agrammatism, which co co-occurred with receptive agrammatism, supposedly, and that was the overarching grammatical deficit. Um, that turns out probably not to be true. Um, at least they dissociate um, neuroanatomically. Uh, so what may be an overarching grammatical component though are lesions that involve posterior areas. So you damage the PSTS MTG, you get sentence comprehension deficits and you get expressive grammatical problems that, that emerge in terms of paragrammatism. And so that is a part of the syntactic system, I would argue that uh, does show its um, show its face in both expressive and receptive tasks. Okay, so that's that's basically, and the same holds true for phonology. So you damage frontal areas, and you can get articulatory problems, but your receptive phonology you can perceive speech just fine. Whereas if you damage posterior areas, you you can end up having um, you know problems on both ends. Um, but you need more bilateral lesions to do that. It's a little more complicated, but nonetheless, that's the principle. Right. So then, I, I, yeah, sorry. No, you, you could also have the case where, you know, the, there's the, the same computational procedure is not necessarily executed by the same brain. Area, right? You could have a kind of multiple realizability process where you have a more abstract neural code that might be implementing it. And this is where brain dynamics you know, could, could come in. So this, you know, you're not necessarily locked into the idea that one particular area always executes the same operation, right? It could be I mean, this has also been shown in, in all sorts of like, you know, primate literature where you have uh, a particular neural code, which takes place across various portions of cortex. It's the representations that differ, not the actual computation. I, I think there was Mauricio Martins um, had a paper a couple of years ago with, with Friedrich where he shows that hierarchical visual processing, um, recursive visual computation in vision is linked to posterior temporal regions, which is kind of linked to the idea that there is this more general universal generative kind of computation 
um, which might take place in this area, but it's the representations that, that differ, right? So we have linguistic hierarchies versus visual hierarchies. Um, mm. That seems to mesh onto that uh, quite okay. well. So yeah, um, do you have any evidence from neurology? Again, another big question. I'm wondering if you see any evidence from the kind of work that you've done, which supports any particular one of these kind of big general frameworks in the literature, um, you know, uh, construction grammar, or big philosophical views about you know language evolution or language and thought things like that. Is there anything that, that from the particulars you would like to personally see derived from to, to more kind of general ideas? Well, I, I was um, I was kind of raised on Chomsky and syntax, and so that was you know my bias. Maybe people don't maybe not know that, but um, I think I've I think the neural evidence leans a little bit more towards a lexical based grammar in general. Mm -hmm. What particular one? I don't you know I don't think it can tell us that, but I think it. It's more consistent with lexical-based gram grammar and a, a, a syntax component that's built in to some extent to the lexicon, uh, whatever you know, however that ends up being represented. Um, I think, like I like I mentioned previously, I think debates about intelligence and fate and um, and language. Um, I think uh, the little bit of data that oh, well, the massive amount of data that's been done in the past looking at relationships between IQ and language abilities. Uh, plus a little bit more that we've done points to a, um, a separability of, of uh, language and intelligence. So I'm not sure I buy ideas that, um, that aspects of, for example, syntax evolved for the intellect and, and then only later were externalized um, unless, and I think we were having this debate on Twitter, unless the definition of syntax is so abstract that it's just a component of a combinatorial semantics anyway. Um, so uh, yeah, um, so that's that's a thought on that big question. But beyond that, I don't think we can say much more about you know which about the details of, of any of those ideas. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have one more question, and I'll hand it over to the. Uh, I'll ask some questions from the from the Q and A. Um, you mentioned a little bit about natural selection. And I'm kind of curious, I think your answer for this might concern connectivity profiles or white matter maybe, but um, where do that laws of form, uh, you know, physical constraints and things like that, where do they factor in, in your thinking about evolution? Um, because obviously it can't all be, you know, natural selections, just that's just a single thought in evolution. Um, so I'm thinking of people like Sterling and Lachlan's uh, textbook, Principles of Neural Design, where they talk about the brain as being wired to optimize, you know, wireline or whatever. Is there some kind of lower level uh, kind of physical principle that you see as connecting to your work on brain connectivity, because that's obviously what you're what you're focusing on. Can that be grounded and motivated to explore language? Yeah, I you know I think one principle that does seem to be uh, instructive for theory development is um, connectivity constraints, where reason regions that need to be connected and interacting quickly tend to be closer to each other. So I, I think you can. There are constraints in terms of the locations that some of these networks end up in that are based on, um, you know, mechanical constraints and and things like that. Um, and from that, I I think it's reasonable to make inferences based on the location of an area um, what it might be doing. So, like for example, the the lexical um, lemma syntactic area that I've been talking about, its location matters. Like I don't think that that region would have ever evolved in you know, the medial parietal lobe or something. It's just not in the right place. Um, so I think there are constraints like that, absolutely. And there are certainly plenty of room for, for just dynamic systems um, evolution, things like what Simon Kirby talks about, things like, um, you know, all those ideas are, are reducing the problem space that natural selection has to deal with. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I think there are lots of things that we can't just think abstractly and ignore all those, uh, those other possibilities. Um, uh, we, need, we need a bigger, a bigger picture that includes um, physical dynamics, uh, all those sorts of things. So what, one final issue that I think ties into the model that you present at the end is the issue of um, what language is actually used for. So I wanted to kind of push you a little bit on the kind of assumption slash maybe stipulation in a lot of work that, like you said earlier, the idea that language is some kind of communicative device, you know, primarily for communities like sending messages to other people. Um, but how does that mesh in with the idea that so much of actual, you know, real world language use has nothing to do with, you know, communication? So 
thinking in, you know, sitting in your office, thinking about an idea, uh, using language, writing it down, you know, walking home, uh, talking to yourself, uh, mm. speaking to people, knowing that they won't, you know, listen to what you're saying, but you say it because you feel like you have to say it. Uh, informal conversation, you know, talking with colleagues, small talk, which has zero kind of communicative, uh, you know, function really, or, or motivation. Uh, it's merely conducted for maintaining, you know, friendly relationships. Like you can't, you can't just walk down the corridor and, uh, you know, blank people, you have to say hello to them and talk about the weather, right? To maintain that sense of friendship or whatever. Um, these are not really, these don't strike me as examples of communication really, right? It's, you could call it communication in the sense of, you know, uh, sending a message and it being recovered. Or communication as, as a kind of, the kind of, the, 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 the driving force of language doesn't seem to be as, as clearly motivated for me as the kind mm. of cognitive in, in, intellectual perspective that, that we've already discussed. So how can you, how can a communicative model of language be defended when so much of actual language use is either non-communicative or kind of, uh, you know, adjacent to communicative goals, right? Yeah, so I, I mean, just because language is is used as social grooming doesn't necessarily mean that that, that is, um, I mean, you can't control how a system that has evolved is used. And since we're social creatures, um, we're gonna use a system like language for social grooming and for, you know, all of those other things that, you know, as you point out, aren't particularly communicative. And it was just a matter of, you know, that, if that was the only thing that language communicated or the dominant thing that language communicated, um, I don't think that it would have, have, have evolved. I think language, um, the usefulness of language from an evolutionary standpoint is to crowdsource knowledge and technology and um, information. Um, and that's probably what was driving it, not necessarily how we use things. I mean, I think um, I, think I pointed out this before that obviously um, sex evolved for reproduction, but how much of how much of it do we actually use for reproduction? Very little, um, it turns out. So you can't you can't necessarily look at how something is actually used and conclusively say, well, this is how it's dominantly used. So obviously, its evolution can't be that. Um, uh, certainly, there are highly communicable things that we use language for that do provide information that's relevant for survival in our uh, in our ancestors lives but what about um, the idea that you know the idea that all the things that you're communicating um you mentioned technology and things like that the things that you're communicating are actually themselves constructed internally by this generative system so these cool ideas that you're communicating these these rich structured technological advances are actually the kinds of things that you can only generate in the first place Without having that kind of combinatorial capacity, so you could you you do use it to communicate, but you also use it ab initio, right at the beginning. So there's it's not as if you know you, we are social creatures, but we're also deeply anti-social creatures too, right? There's a very strong intellectual individualist drift in human nature, which is just as important as as communicating to people. And um, so I don't see I don't see that as necessarily a rebuttal. Yeah, I you know I think I think this sort of debate or discussion is going to end up being resolved by realizing that we're coming at the same problem from different sides. So um, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of conceptual structure and combinatorics and all that that are, are, are part of what language is involved in. But the way I think of it is that there was kind of some convergent evolution. There was, there was the ability to control your vocal tract so you could make vocalizations like a song species can and communicate in a rudimentary unsophisticated way that way. Um, but at the same time, there was evolution towards a rich combinatorial system um, that was able to do all this conceptual, you know, conceptual stuff that you're, you're talking about. Now, maybe we want to call that syntax. And if that is what syntax is, then yeah, I think that is the, a principled uh, way of thinking about it. Um, my, my intuition is that um, most of what we end up studying as syntax is probably not that. It's a way of going between that rich conceptual structure and a fairly rich phonology, essentially, by the time you get to, you know, what might have happened. And, and syntax 
as we study it as linguists, was that little bit in between um, that enabled the link between those two things. Maybe in the end, the, the boundary between what I'm thinking of as syntax and what you're thinking of as syntax is not is basically the same thing, and both views are kind of right, you know. Um, so yeah, I get your point. Um, I think we're just kind of drawing the line between syntax and conceptual structure in different places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, before we go to questions, just it's worth pointing out that there's been there's been plenty of people expressing their thanks for us for the brilliant lecture. So it's worth highlighting that. Um, quite a Thank few questions. Have. There's a question by Pietro Rigatti who says, thank you very much for the amazing lecture. I was wondering if we could think of the dual stream model in the many contexts of speaking more than one language. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, it, so how do you represent those two languages? Um, uh, I don't know. I do think, I mean, if you learn two languages natively, it's gonna involve roughly the same network um, and, and the system is just gonna have to be flexible enough to do this kind of mapping um, in two different ways, a different lexicon, a different phonology, um, and, uh, and somehow um, crowd two um, mapping systems into the same space. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this, I don't think anything is different in two languages that are acquired natively um, with respect to the overall architecture. Um, if you acquire a second language later, I think it's an open question that developmentalists, uh, people who study this would probably know more than me, which is maybe we don't use exactly the same systems, that, you, that parts of that system are no longer available. And so you have to use more consciously driven networks. Um, and that's bilingualism is, is certainly not an expertise of mine. So I don't want to overstep my boundaries. Good question though. Yeah, another question from Pietra is, during comprehension, if an error is perceived, could there be some involvement of the motor system in recognizing the error? I, I don't think so. I, my view is um, that the motor system doesn't have to be involved at all in receptive language function um, for under normal circumstances. That is when you're not loading, um, overloading the system in terms of its working memory or whatever. Um, so no, I don't think there's any error signals in the motor system that are helping with error detection uh, on the receptive side. Um, to answer your question, that's that's my view. I know a lot of people think that um, the motor system assists in perception uh, and comprehension, um, and I've looked at that and provided some evidence. And, and if it does, it's very very minor under abnormal conditions. Uh, that is um, near threshold levels, all those sorts of things. Under normal conditions, like we're doing now, the motor system just isn't involved. Period. That's my view currently, but I'm open to new data. Uh, next question is from a W Machin, someone you might, you might be familiar with. He says, uh, with respect to neurocomputational homology, what is the sensory motor homologue of the hierarchical and recursive computational power of language? Why isn't phonology recursive, but syntax is? So yeah, so, so, so there is some debate in minimalist phonology about phonology maybe exhibiting you know, headedness or whatever. Well, even if phonology is recursive, I guess it's, yeah, it's certainly a totally different type of recursion. Yeah. Well, that's the big problem, right? With syntax is the, it does have these unique features and that's what Chomsky has been harping on for decades. And I think, I mean, I, I still see it as a problem. I don't know that we have a perfect homologue to recursion um, at the level that we see it in, in language. Some people have argued that there's bits of it in motor control, maybe there's some, um, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. What I do think I know, what I believe currently, is that the basic architecture is gonna hold for syntax as well. And something like hierarchical representations interfacing with a, lexica, a linearization network, I think is the right way to sketch it. Um, but these questions about where does recursion come from and all of that are just detailed questions that we're just, we're just not there yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, next question is from Latin A. Bullock. Um, I think you've done some work on this, Greg, so you should be able to, um, I think, answer this. He says, how do you see the motor system aiding speech comprehension in noise? How would that fit into the dual stream model? And do you see the listener as translating the speech sounds into inner speech? Yeah, good question. So I have, um, I have done work on speech and noise, and that was the claim. So um, all of the previous studies looking at 
the effects of damage to the motor system on speech perception and auditory comprehension tended to show no effect. Um, uh, and if you look at, for example, when there's no noise, you look at all the TMS studies where you stimulate motor cortex and you show an effect on speech perception, um, all of those studies use a syllable discrimination based task, first of all. So they're using the wrong, possibly the wrong task or a task that's biased towards implicating um, sensory motor circuits. Plus they're all at near threshold levels. So you have to present it where the stimuli are virtually ambiguous. And, and then the motor system seems to contribute a little bit up to maybe 10%. If you present those stimuli in clear speech, you don't, or you know, more normal super threshold levels, you don't get any effects on, on the motor system. So um, the claim was that the motor system gets involved when the signal is noisy, which is why we did the study where we had um, people listening to words, not doing the discrimination task, but listening to words and comprehending them in noise. And we asked whether um, we would get an effect in motor areas, motor related areas under those conditions. And the answer is no, we don't. It's all posterior temporal um, uh, regions that get implicated. So I, I, I think that um, idea, which was reasonable, has been disproven by the, the study that we should have published within a few months. Um, I also want to quickly read out a qualification from William Matchin. Um, this is about the question that I asked about synthetic memory. He says, uh, it seems as though damage to Broca's area doesn't impair the ability to make acceptability judgments that would likely require that kind of push down stack, right? The kind of um, memory stuff that I mentioned. Um, I also think that a memory mechanism may be a qualitatively different um, from the process that Broca's area underlies, with Broca's area supporting a more exceptional mechanism, not needed for basic derivation, right? Yeah, that, that sounds, that sounds yep. reasonable. Um, okay, so next question is from, another question from Latin Um He says, given that you say receptive language abilities are a subset of expressive abilities, um, on the issue of receptive bilinguals, do these people simply not have the dorsal stream for their receptive language? More generally, do you see full bilinguals as posing any problems for the dual stream model? Um, so what types of accommodations do we need to make for bilinguals, uh, if any? Yeah, so by receptive bilinguals, I assume you mean people who can understand a language but can't speak it very well. Right. Um, that's actually some, you know, some of the evidence for this asymmetry. Kids and adults who are acquiring a language tend to do better at comprehension um, than production, at least in kids, they're, they're the comprehension abilities outstrip their production abilities and the production abilities catch up later. Right? That's evidence for this asymmetry. It's no challenge to the dual stream model. It, it is a, um, it's consistent with the idea that uh, of this uh, expressive uh, receptive asymmetry uh, that the, the ventral stream is separate from the expressive stream, from the dorsal stream. So I think it's quite consistent. All of those data are quite consistent and ditto, uh, bilinguals who who have the expressive component that's just you know another language doing what the first language does so it's all the principles should hold yeah yeah um sebastian mancha asks in more theoretical terms would we say that during production linearization is occurring um in parallel with hierarchical derivation i think you may have answered this from my question but yeah yeah i think so um so yeah, it's the dynamics of that relationship. So in, in the case of phonology, if you remember some of the, the diagrams that I had, from the lexical level, you have parallel inputs into a posterior area and an and a anterior area, um, which um, activate both in parallel. And then the two interact to basically fine tune the motor plan. And there's a precedent, I never talk about it, that, that but that view was partially inspired by um, ideas from linguistics, um, uh, but also partially inspired by motor control observations that when we plan some movements, um, there is an initial kind of course movement that is then later fine tuned by perceptual feedback. And so that's kind of the idea I have. You have a general sense of what this, how to, how to code the motor plan for this word or phrase or whatever, you activate it and then you check it against the target before you actually produce as a fine tuning kind of mechanism. Um, another question from Heidi Moss. Has anyone tested how these individuals, people with lesions are affected in singing? Um, does that help or harm elements of syntax comprehension 
if it's, if it's associated with melody. So I guess she's referring to the fact that, you know, singing can help people in all sorts of ways in terms of production and what have you. Yeah, there's a long history of people thinking about that stuff. Um, therapeutically, people have tried to use, you know, melodic intonation therapy and they tried it back in the 70s or 80s or a while and then realized it didn't work well, but it's been revived a bit and I, I'm not sure the status. I don't hear a lot about it, so I'm, my guess is that it's not that successful. Um, I've been interested in relation between music and uh, language for quite a while and tinkered in this area. Um, we've done some, but very little has been done in, the, in stroke work, um, uh, contrasting these directly. We've done a little bit looking at repetition of me melodies versus um, you know, phrases and things. And, and we see similar areas, but we behaviorally we get dissociation. So those seem to be at least in that kind of task, um, a dissociable ability. Um, but it's an interesting question. And I think there are probably some shared components. I think, um, I think there's interesting differences, but also some, some deep relationships as well. Um, one final question from Latin Ebola. He says, has the supplementary motor area surfaced in any of your analyses or meta-analyses, given its established role as key to speech sequencing and timing, um, either in phonotactics or in linearizing syntactic hierarchies? Yeah, so just, just the general role of the supplementary motor area. Yeah, you'll notice that uh, um, my brain maps and focus is extremely biased, is lateral cortex, essentially. So I know that there are other areas that are involved, including supplementary motor area, uh, subcortical structures. Um, there's lots of stuff that don't make it into the to my thinking. And it's not because I don't think it's doing something important. I think the SMA is. We see it in some of our work, um, some of our fMRI sequencing studies, we see SMA showing up. So yes, it's part of the network, but I haven't um, made the attempt yet to build it into the model and you know add anything to the literature. I could throw it in there just because we know SMA is doing stuff like that, but it's not novel. So I don't you know really focus on it, but it's a good, always good to point out what's missing in these things. And there's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Thank you very much, Greg, for um, you know, the very generous discussion time and also the brilliant lecture. Really well, it. thank you. Yep. I, it was nice talking to you, Elliot, as usual. Thank you very much, Greg, once again. And thank you. Thanks a lot, Elliot. And um, yeah, do you, do you want to say something else before we, we finish the transmission? I don't have anything to add. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And I guess I do have something to add. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for the invitation. And I, uh, you can reach out to me on my Twitter account or email. I'm happy to talk to any of you more about this stuff. And I'll try to post my slides uh, in the next week or so. Thanks a lot. OK, bye, everyone.